In the largest state in the Union, a state built on gold rushes and old oil pipelines, 90 pound king salmon and 20 pound king crabs, a lot of things come prefaced by the phrase, the Great Alaskan. There's the Great Alaskan Salmon Bank and the Great Alaskan Lumberback Show and the legendary 8.6 Great Alaskan Earthquake and of course, a, spe a species of larger than life male citizen who shall be referred to from here on out as the Great Alaskan Dad. Some identifiers. The Great Alaskan Dad flies his plane on floats in the summer and on skis in the winter. He hunts for caribou, moose, wild sheep, wild goats, geese and ducks, as well as fishes for halibut, salmon and trout. No matter where he goes, his outfit remains the same. Falling down hip boots, drugstore sunglasses with Polaroid lenses for spotting fish underwater, patch wool pants, and a Stern's life jacket with a plastic tag that reads, pull in the case of emergency, which has never been pulled, despite his frequent, almost fatal emergencies. A buck knife, the blade, the blade stained with dried, unidentified blood and slime, dangles from a lanyard somewhere on his person. At one time or another, he has suffered from an unforgettable, for all involved, case of beaver fever, a violent lower intestinal disease caused by drinking downstream from an active lodge. At one time or another, due, a plane, due to a plane crash or bad planning, he has had to live four days in the bush off tasteless ancient pilot bread and a jar of powdered tang. The great Alaskan dad can sew on his own buttons, patch his own waders, repack his own shotgun shen cells, and repair his own boat, even as the boat is filling with water in the middle of the ocean. The great Alaskan dad can land a Piper Cub on a 150 foot long gravel bar, which is technically impossible, at least according to all aviation authorities. He can outrun a grizzly bear by running very fast, or at least faster than his hunting buddy, which by the way, according to the great Alaskan dad, is the only way to survive a grizzly bear, so don't curl up, play dead, and make yourself into human meatball like those dopey forest rangers advise. He can make a fire out of wet wood in the middle of winter, just as the blizzard starts, using his last match, which he strikes with his fingers nearly, but not totally, paralyzed by frostbite. He can and will also defend the veracity of the above three claims to the point of shooting saliva across the room should any family member dare challenge the few overly extravagant or Jack London-esque details therein. In addition, though he might not bring this up around the campfire, the great Alaskan dad has invented a diaper out of alder leaves and garbage bags when all the pampers that the great Alaskan mom packed happened to fall out of the raft. The great Alaskan dad has piloted a plane while his airsick great Alaskan child projectile vomited inside the fur-lined hood of his parka. And he is not mythically or romantically or hyperbolically in the least grabbed that same child's belt loop or leg right before that child fell into the raging stream or fell out of the flying plane or slipped off the boat or wandered off the cliff or tumbled down the crevasse of a glacier or ate the poison blueberries that were not blueberries, or sauntered directly into the path of a black bear with two newborn cubs. Where all this experience might not help him, though, is in the land of toothbrushes and crustless peanut butter sandwiches, recommended daily vitamins and monsters under the bed. In short, the world of domestic survival, which is where my great Alaskan dad and I land the first summer after my parents' divorce. It's June, the first week of salmon fishing season. For the past six months, I've been away from Anchorage, Alaska, where I grew up, in order to relocate with my mom to Baltimore, Maryland, her childhood home. The first day I'm back up north, I find out that dad has moved from our old house by the mountains into a new house across town. The house is big and sunny, and filled with lots of wall-to-wall -wall beige carpeting, but no furniture. It's eight o'clock at night. Time for bed, Dad says. He rolls out two identical down bags, bags designed to keep you warm in temperatures up to 40 below on the beige carpet. I hop in my bag, crumple up my jeans for a pillow. The sky through the windows is a blazing, sun-heated white. We have no blinds or curtains. Shut your eyes, he mumbles. I shut my eyes. But I'm eight years old. I squirm, I hum, I kick dad whispering, I can't sleep, can you sleep, over and over? 
Tell your brain it's nighttime. Your brain will believe anything if you say it over and over. It's nighttime, I say, my voice echoing off the blank plaster. But my father's brain is better at believing than mine, it seems. He is asleep already, his mustache twitching in mid-dream.